Welcome to Ring of Fire. I'm Farron Cousins sitting in for Mike Papantonio this week. Coming up on today's show, we'll explain how the growing gap between the haves and the have-nots is creating a very serious threat to our democracy. We'll explain the latest developments in the fight to keep the internet open, and we'll tell you why the incoming class of GOP congressmen might actually be the most selfish elected officials in history. We have all that and more coming up, so get ready. You've just stepped into the ring of fire. You can't change Washington from the inside. You can only change it from the outside. Grand jury secrecy rules. For political gain. The press can find out. That has nothing to do with politics, but go ahead. It wouldn't bother me. Oops. <laughs> If the current Congress has been labeled the most obstructionist Congress in history, the upcoming session will almost certainly be labeled as the most selfish in history. In a few short weeks, the GOP will take over the Senate and they'll see their numbers grow in the House of Representatives. This new crop of Republican lawmakers have made it clear that they do not care about the concerns of the American people. They don't care about our environment. They don't care about the economy. The only thing that they care about is winning their next election and they are desperate to win at any price. And that price just happens to be the well-being of nearly every American citizen. I say nearly every American citizen because there will be a select few who will benefit tremendously from the new Congress. Unfortunately, those few will be the millionaire and billionaire classes, the people who don't need any help from the government. And this isn't just wild speculation. The new class of GOP lawmakers have already laid out their plans for the next two years, and it looks like this. The first order of business will be to roll back every single environmental protection that has been put into place over the last decade. Republican Senator Mitch McConnell of Kentucky, who will become the Senate Majority Leader when the 2015 Congress convenes, announced last week that one of his main goals was to, quote, rein in the EPA. One of the main items that McConnell has problems with is the agency's power plant emissions standards that would cut down on the amount of allowable air pollution from coal-fired power plants. McConnell said that he feels a, quote, deep responsibility to stop these power plant rules. McConnell ran his campaign on an anti-environment, pro-coal platform, playing up Kentucky's fears that the EPA's policy would kill jobs in the coal-dependent state. McConnell's challenger, Democratic candidate Allison Grimes, could have easily challenged those talking points, but failed to do so. Nevertheless, the facts are there, and the coal industry has actually been a net negative for the state of Kentucky. In a nutshell, the coal industry has had devastating effects on the state when considering only the direct costs that the coal mining industry encounters, which includes research, development, training, and repairing the infrastructure that's destroyed or degraded during coal mining and moving, the industry is actually in the red. But the true cost of coal for Kentucky is more than what the industry spends or puts back into the economy. The residents who aren't involved in the industry in any way are paying a very large price. Coal mining and coal ash dumping sites are riddled with both poverty and exceedingly higher than average cancer rates. Both of these external costs are shifted onto the taxpayers and the federal government who will ultimately have to pay for assistance and health care for those affected by the industry's activities. And it gets even worse. Kentucky, as a direct result of the coal industry, is home to congressional districts that rank last in the country in life expectancy, general well-being, and emotional and physical health. The reason these statistics about Kentucky are so important is because this has become the new Republican Party blueprint for America. Their constant attacks on the EPA's power plant emission rules could turn the rest of the country into the same pollution-filled quagmire that Kentucky has become. The Hill has reported that Republicans are planning a, quote, all-out assault on President Obama's environmental agenda, and this will include rolling back limits on ground-level ozone pollution, allowing more toxic mercury to be pumped into the air from power plants, and allowing more mountaintop removal mining, and not to mention the passage of the Keystone XL pipeline. They're also attacking rules on fracking and offshore drilling to allow those activities to expand. And those are just the attacks on environmental protections. The attack on science from these selfish lawmakers is even worse. Republican Senator James Inhofe, the most prominent climate change denier in the U.S. Senate, is poised to take control of the Environment and Public Works Committee, which will prove to be a disaster for the slight progress that could be made to combat climate change, as well as on the health of every single American citizen. The question is, why? 
why are these Republicans fighting so hard to destroy our environment? What is in it for them? Answer is as simple as it is obvious, campaign money. The fossil fuel industry pumped $50 million into this year's midterm elections. That's only 20 million less than they spent in 2012 when they tried to buy the presidency from Mitt Romney. $50 million to put climate change denying greedy Republicans into office and these self-serving politicians have already laid out the blueprint for how they will repay these heavy-hitting campaign funders. And that's what this is all about. Mitch McConnell isn't concerned about the coal industry allegedly losing jobs, which they won't. He's concerned about getting that coal industry money to fund his elections. He doesn't believe that pollution is harmless. He's being indirectly paid to say those things. The Republican Party sold its soul to big business long ago in the hopes that it would keep their aging, irrelevant party alive, and so far, it appears to be working. But environmental protections aren't the only things on the chopping block. We're about to see the forward momentum on a host of other issues ground to a halt. Common sense gun control measures will be off the table. Minimum wage increase on a federal level will be gone. Jobs and infrastructure bills will be history. Net neutrality won't exist. Disastrous trade deals like the TPP will be fast-tracked. The gap between the haves and the have-nots will continue to grow as tax breaks for corporations and millionaires are extended or even expanded, forcing those with fewer means to pay even more. And we'll be talking about all of those things today. These issues that would benefit the American public will disappear because we have a Republican Party that is so selfish, so narrow-minded, and solely focused on self-preservation. There should be absolutely no doubt in your mind that the Republican Party does not care about you, and as much, you shouldn't care about their next re-election bid. Advancements in the last few decades have helped make our roadways safer for drivers, but corporate greed and negligence are once again turning our highways into very deadly places, and I have attorney David Haynes with me now to tell us about a few of the issues that American motorists need to be aware of. So, David, uh, we've talked, you know, earlier in the year about the whole General Motors recall. Uh, there's a lot of new developments with the story, but just real quick, kind of take us back and explain what has happened, you know, in the last 12 months with the General Motors recall. Well, this is a situation which is very serious and has threatened uh, the safety of drivers, not only in GM vehicles, but in any other vehicle on the road which might be struck by a GM vehicle. There was a very serious problem with the ignition switch and the coil. It was a, it was a pretty small problem, but it has uh, very catastrophic uh, consequences. And GM engineers knew about this problem, yet failed to remedy it. And essentially, the coil uh, can become, uh, the, the car can be cut off when the spring does not properly work. It's some, something as simple as if a driver has a lot of keys or a lot of things on their key ring that will weight uh, the ignition down, and that actually will turn the car off or it's in a lot of these small GM vehicles where the passenger compartment's pretty small and their knee might hit the key, it actually, the ignition switch will turn off, disable the vehicle so you lose steering and the airbags are disabled as well and they essentially become missiles out there on the highways. And so this is really the background of the story that we've been monitoring on this program and in our law practice. And so when the car becomes disabled, like you said, it, it, it essentially becomes a missile on the highway. You have no, no brakes, no acceleration, no steering. You're, you're essentially just at the whim of, of gravity and, you know, whatever is in front of you. And that's what's so dangerous. Like you said, it could be something as simple as you have a heavy key ring or you have a couple extra keys on your keychain, and that can completely disable it. You accidentally knock it with your knee. I, I do that in my car all the time. And, I mean, that, that's how dangerous it is, something so simple that you wouldn't even think of can, can kill you, your passengers, or, or anyone else out there on the road. And, and, and just in the last couple of weeks, we have had some major developments with this story. Uh, we've gotten some emails uh, uncovered from General Motors. Tell us what we've learned from all of that. Well, the, additionally, we've had yeah, late-breaking emails which have been released due to a judge's uh, decision down in a Texas court. We knew, uh, first off, that the engineers knew of this problem uh, for quite some time, many months, if not years, and failed to alert the executives, according to the executives and Mary, Mary Barra, the CEO of GM and others, 
uh, their general counsel, who's now uh, resigned, but uh, that the engineers knew of this and failed to act on it. They didn't uh, change the part number and a num number of other safety protocols were violated. Now we found, find out this week that once it finally got up to the chain of command and they were going to uh, order the replacement parts, 500 uh, replacement parts for these uh, ignition springs, uh, that they didn't even issue the recall for uh, weeks and weeks after that, almost two months after. And uh, at least one death and 85 injuries have been attributed just to this period of time from the point that they ordered all the replacement parts and just sprung this huge replacement order on, on the uh, parts manufacturer to the point that they actually issued uh, the public recall. So it's just a culture of cover-up uh, and deception, not wanting to take uh, accountability and responsibility, and it, it's corporate greed, and it has killed people on the roadways, bottom line. I know. Uh, uh, right now we're at, I think, about 32 people have lost their lives as a result of this recall. And as you pointed out, there was almost a, a, an order placed for about half a million, uh, 500,000 of these replacement coil springs two months before GM even bothered to tell the public that there was a problem. And I understand, obviously, you want to be prepared when you announce the recall for people to bring their cars in. But their negligence, their delay in that cost at least one person their life, uh, uh, several dozen more injured because they sat on it, they waited, they knew there was a problem, and they chose not to act. And that's, that's what's so important here is they made the decision to not act. And, and, and moving right along here, speaking of decisions not to act on corporate negligence, we've got other cases out there, this uh, Trinity guardrail which anybody, anytime you drive down the highway, you see those big metal guardrails on the side. They're meant to protect you. If you crash into them, they will crumble and uh, essentially absorb the impact so you don't go flying off into the woods or off a cliff. And now we're finding out that one of the, the main companies that makes those guardrails has been cutting corners for years. years. Tell, us, tell us what's happened with this. Yeah, this is a story that we've been monitoring, very disturbing. The Tr Trinity Guardrail, it's out of uh, Texas. It's a company which has been a government uh, you know, partner and installing many of the guardrails on the highways and the interstates around the country. Come to find out that they had cut corners in order to increase corporate profit. And essentially what we have is an in-terminal failure on behalf of these guardrails. They, they changed the design and it, it, was, it was a fairly minor change, but it's had a very significant impact. Uh, and they've re decreased the size of the end terminal. And so what happens is instead of the guardrail giving way and ribboning away uh, as a safety feature, it basically just gives way. We've had a number of the, the guardrail pieces have then shot up and impaled uh, individuals, passengers through the vehicle itself. And uh, it's very, very disturbing. This uh, first came to light uh, through a really became national news as a result of a verdict in Texas in a uh, government fraud case where uh, Trinity was ordered to pay $175 million in damages. And this has really uh, woken up a lot of the departments of transportation around the country. In my home state of Virginia, uh, the Department of Transportation is removing every ET guardrail on the roadway. And, and there are thousands, tens of thousands uh, of these units out there on the highway. And it's a terrible situation. They're uh, no longer being installed on the highway, but uh, they're present on, in about 30 states which have not been removed. And so what are motors to do? There's really nothing that you can do except know that these guardrails are not going to protect you as the way that they, sh the way that they should. And governments, each state government and the federal government needs to be looking very closely at this issue. And so uh, the big issue with these, as you pointed out, is that they've, they've cut back on the, essentially the amount of metal in the design on these. They, you know, by putting less metal in it, the company saves money. But what that does is it takes away the safety features of it. And as you pointed out, it rather than becoming a barrier, it almost becomes a knife. And it cuts through a vehicle, can come up from underneath a vehicle, depending on you know the, the point of impact. And it, it, it's, it's killing people. This, this safety feature designed to prevent deaths is now causing them. And it, 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 it's very similar to this next issue that we have here with these uh, Takata airbags that are in millions of vehicles all over the world. And again, it's a, it's a system that's designed to save people's lives. And because of corporate negligence, we're now seeing that it's costing lives. Tell us the Takata story. Yeah, th this is really the third in the trifecta of these very serious safety issues, and we're not being alarmist at, at all. All three of these situations are 
very serious safety issues where we see intentional corporate conduct and neglect where they're making conscious decisions to endanger the safety of people out on the roadway. Uh, two members of Congress have called for a criminal investigation over the Takata airbags. Essentially what we have is uh, in states, particularly in the South and uh, other places where you have more moisture and humidity, there's a, com a compound which is degrading in the airbag, which is then when it does deploy, it deploys at extremely rapid rate and you actually have pieces of metal from the vehicle itself are being shot out. And uh, we're involved with some of these cases on behalf of individuals who are having large gashes and cuts, lacerations around the head, neck, and torso because of this defect. Uh, Takata, a Japanese company, knew. Now documents have come out in emails that they knew of the problem, yet they neglected to fix it for years. Uh, so again, it's conscious corporate decision making to cover up uh, the situation tried to protect corporate profits and, st and stock prices. And we started, the recall started to trickle out with Honda and 50,000 vehicles here and there. You know, now Nissan, uh, now we're at recalls of over 11 million vehicles on the road. This is a very popular airbag. Uh, you need to check if you have one of the recalled uh, models and get in. Only one in 10 owners of a recalled uh, vehicle have actually gotten the fix done at this point. So very serious. And, and like you said, we've got 11 million of these vehicles that we know of right now out there on the roadways. It's it's Nissan, Honda, Toyota, GM, you know, uh, along with the other GM recall we've talked about. I mean, these all, all, all three of these issues here, again, very serious. Consumers need to be aware of them. And, you know, you, you can go online, check if there are any recalls outstanding on your vehicle. And, and I, I encourage everyone to do that because these are life threatening issues that that have to be fixed you know these recalls they should not even uh, cost you any money go get it done it's worth it it's for your safety the safety of everybody else out there please go online and and find out uh, what you need to do to make things safer uh david unfortunately oh, i'm sorry go ahead no, I was just going to say, Farron, that we need to demand greater accountability and corporate responsibility from these companies. This is inexcusable to have these sorts of problems on our roadways in, the, in this day and age. Thank you for bringing attention to these issues. Well, thank you for being out there and fighting on behalf of consumers. And, uh, David, we'll check in with you again next week. Thank you. Thank you, Farron. President Obama recently announced his support for net neutrality, saying that we shouldn't throttle the Internet speeds based on how much a corporation is willing to pay. But ultimately, the, the decision lies with Tom Wheeler, the chairman of the FCC, and he seems more than willing to destroy the public's main source of information. Join me now to talk about net neutrality is Tim Carr, the senior director of strategy for Free Press. Tim, you wrote a piece recently where you discussed the fact that uh, President Obama, he's got these new incoming Republican majorities in the Senate and the House, a, a stronger majority in the House. So... What are his options? Does he try to push forward with things that he's been attempting or does he go for a completely new issue? And uh, uh, from what we've seen, it looks like he's maybe going to go after a couple new issues like net neutrality. Well, yeah, certainly it seems like um, now that he is free of midterm election concerns and now that he is free of re-election concerns, he has returned to some of the core issues uh, from his campaign. That was his campaign back in 2008 when he made net neutrality, certainly his signature telecom policy issue. So uh, we saw earlier this month, Obama came out with a very strong statement in support of net neutrality. And he didn't just say he supports net neutrality, but he also called on the FCC to take specific action in order to get us there. So that was a, that was a pretty bold move from Obama. And we're seeing that he's doing this, similar things on other issues immigration reform, things of that sort. So uh, this is a, a new face to the, uh, to the White House and one that net neutrality supporters like my organization are, are happy to see. And so one of the things he had suggested was regulating the Internet as if it were a public utility. Uh, what, what exactly does that mean? If we made the Internet a public utility, you know, what does that change or what does that well, protect? Know, I don't, that's, that wasn't his suggestion that is actually the way that that's been interpreted in fact what he has been calling for is for internet service providers uh, companies like Comcast and AT&T and Verizon that sell us access to fall under another category of regulations that would allow the FCC to prevent them from blocking uh, content from favoring certain content websites 
over others from degrading other websites. So what he was calling for was a regulation of internet service providers. And as we know, uh, it's not a regulation of the internet. AT&T and Comcast are no more the internet than a company like Georgia Pacific or Warehouser are the forests. Right. Uh, and yet we have rules that, that prevent them from clear cutting our national parks. And this is the same way of creating a, a legal structure that prevents these companies from censoring free speech. It protects internet users and it preserves the openness of the internet uh, as we've known it from its inception. And when you bring up companies like AT&T and Comcast, it, it's important to point out that these are both, you know, very massive companies that have spent millions of dollars uh, just this year alone already, you know, trying to lobby for this issue because for them, uh, uh, getting rid of any kind of net neutrality, making uh, users have to pay more uh, to get their website going at a faster speed would be a huge payday for them. So how does that lobbying, all of this corporate money, we know what it does to elections, we know what it does to politicians, uh, do you think that's going to play a role in any of the decisions we may see coming? Well, it has, and lobbying plays a role in almost any policy decision that's made in Washington. On uh, net neutrality, we have this kind of weird a situation where there are these opposite worlds. There's the Beltway and conventional wisdom inside Washington where these companies have so much political power and financial clout is that the FCC is not going to do what President Obama has asked them to do. But outside of the Beltway, we've had more than 4 million people comment at the FCC. There are more comments on this issue at the FCC than any other issue in the history of um, of the federal agency that have said we need strong net neutrality rules. They've endorsed what Obama has just endorsed, this Title II reclassification of Internet service providers. So, so uh, the grassroots, the net roots, the president now um, are telling Washington it needs to move in one direction. Now, the, the, the problem that we have is that the Federal Communications Commission is an agency that is often captive of, of corporate special interests, AT&T, Comcast, Verizon. They send their lobbyists up there on a daily basis. So it's our job, the job of my organization, Free Press, which organizes outside of Washington, to make sure that that uh, popular uh, message is getting through in a way that will get this, this chairman, Chairman Tom Wheeler, the FCC chairman, to listen to the president and listen to the people instead of trying simply to please those very powerful corporate players. And what has been uh, Chairman Wheeler's position on everything uh, so far? Is he, is he looking like he, he may ignore the telecoms, or, or is he leaning towards their favor? Well, he um, prior to being the chairman of the FCC, he was the top lobbyist for cable companies, and, and prior to that he was the top lobbyist for wireless companies. So he has... Uh, a close tie to the phone and cable lobby, but at the same time, he's also very loyal to President Obama. He was one of his top bundlers for, during both of the Obama campaigns, raised a lot of money for the president's election and re-election efforts. So he's kind of in this this weird position where he uh, he has a, a he's sort of split, and he said he said this term. He says he doesn't. What he's trying to do is split the baby. He used that sort of King Solomon. <laughs> Reference, he said he wants to split the baby in a way that makes everybody happy. But anybody who's familiar with uh, the King Solomon story is that that splitting the baby makes nobody happy. You actually kill the baby, and nobody wants that outcome. So we're hopeful that he'll do the right thing here. And uh, most of these firms, uh, you know, Verizon and AT and T and Sprint, these are some of the same guys who have been major players with the NSA. Uh, you know, as far as the the spying issues go. Uh, do you feel like any of that is going to curry them a little bit more favor in saying like, look, hey, we scratched your back for a very long time. <laughs> is, is there going to be a little bit of payback here? Well, I don't think I don't think that comes into play as much, although I, it does. It's an issue that we need to be aware of, that, that, that there is this very close tie between uh, big government and big corporations in the phone and cable lobby, and, and it, it doesn't only impact issues like net neutrality, there's the history of surveillance where they've worked with the NSA and handing over, over metadata. Um, I don't know that they're using that argument to get the FCC uh, to uh, exchange uh, favor and to not go forward with a net neutrality ruling. I know, though, that they are very concerned about this, and, and if you thought their lobbying over the last couple of years, which, you, as you've mentioned, they spent tens of millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, if you look at their, their whole record on this, 
to kill net neutrality, they're going to increase those efforts uh, as in, in the wake of, of Obama's statement and as this chairman seems to be making some gestures towards accommodating Obama and the public interest. They're very concerned about this and when AT&T gets angry, when AT&T gets concerned inside Washington, things start to happen. So we're very vigilant about that and we want to make sure uh, that they don't uh, use their uh, the, the power of their checkbook uh, to force the agency to pass bad policy. Uh, we've got a little under a minute left here. Real quick, what can our viewers do uh, to help support free press and, and to help keep net neutrality out there in the open? Well, in the first place you can go, of course, is to our website, freepress.net. We have a lot of tools there that people can use, whether they want to call the White House or they, whether they want to contact Congress, call the FCC. We have tools there that they can use. We also have uh, FAQs and other, other resources there. We're part of a larger coalition, too. Another website that uh, Free Press is involved with is called battleforthenet.com. We're working with a number of other groups there that have been doing uh, street actions and, and a lot of other protests. Uh, it's going to be a busy couple of months, so if you want to get involved, uh, now would be a good time to do it. All right. Timothy Carr, thank you very much for, for everything you do, for everything Free Press does, and hopefully uh, this will be another uh, uh, victory that progressives can celebrate uh, in the coming months. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. My pleasure. Not only has the pay gap between workers and CEOs skyrocketed in recent years, but American workers are actually in the dark about how badly they're being taken advantage of by their employers. As the pay gap continues to grow, workers in the middle class are feeling the squeeze, and I have Howard Nations with me to explain how the problem has gotten so bad. Howard, uh, Les Leopold, a uh, very good friend of Ring of Fire, who had him on plenty of times, a writer for Alternet and Salon. He's one of the best out there when it comes to putting together economic statistics and theories. And he's done it again in this new piece that he has out about the, the pay gap between the haves and the have-nots. And he takes it a little bit further than just saying, you know, the rich are making this much, the poor are making this much. Tell us about these new numbers and, and, and theories that he's got out there now. This is very interesting. The issue right now is the pay gap between the average American worker and the CEO of that company. Um, and the conclusion is, amazingly, that in the entire world, we, are the, we have the most unequal pay gap between the average worker, not between the lowest income level, we have the largest gap between the paid worker and the paid CEO in the entire civilized world. Um, and the amazing thing is that this, this didn't show up at all in the recent election. Uh, inequality was obviously not an issue in, in the last election uh, because the pro-business Republicans swept back into office. They catered to the super rich. They catered to their Wall Street donors. Uh, as do many of the d Democrats, for that matter. But the message is, 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 are the voters okay with this kind of disparity? Well, you, you brought up a great point just then, and I, I want to hit it on a second before we move on, but this income inequality, I an issue that affects, you know, the 99%, right. you know, this was not a major campaign issue this year. You know, they, the Democrats could have easily used this issue brought it up to the public, a public who really does care about the issue. They may not know how bad it is, but they do care about it. And instead, uh, the Democrats allowed the Republicans to hijack the conversation, make it about Obamacare and how horrible Obamacare is, putting the Democrats on the defense. Now, uh, sorry, that was just an aside, but you mentioned it, and it is so infuriating when we have numbers like this in front of us, available to everyone, and you, you just see these missed opportunities. But <laughs> so my apologies for going off on that, but you know, uh, let's let's take it back to this issue. Do the people fully understand what's happened? Well, that was his point. It's not that the voters are okay with this kind of disparity. It is that American voters are, as he says, the most clueless in the world. A study was done of fifty-five thousand one hundred eighty-seven people in forty countries and on the issue of severity of the inequality. And the result he found was that 
We are the most unequal developed nation in the world, and we don't know it. We have no clue, we in America have no clue as to the nature and extent of inequality in the U.S. You tell the average person on the street that we're the most unequal country in the world in terms of wage disparity, nobody's going to believe it. But it, it's very true. So it's our lack of knowledge on the issue uh, probably had more to do with the uh, election than anything else. And, you know, uh, Democrats, I think by a margin about five to, to one, and uh, Republicans from a, a margin of about 12 to one, uh, uh, that's what they think the pay gap should be. Democrats say a, a CEO should make five dollars for every one dollar that his uh, uh, employee makes. And as you pointed out, it's not the bottom level employees. You know, it's 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 not the 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 janitors or or people like that. These are the average employees who are right there, the middle, the heart of the company, making things run. Democrats say five to one. Republicans say twelve to one. Obviously, Republicans a little bit more generous with what they want uh, uh, CEOs to make. But still, either one of those, not bad. Not bad considering the fact that currently it is $354 for every $1 that average Joe employee makes. And that is, I mean, that's, that is kind of crazy. I mean, there's nothing out there right now. There should not be any CEOs making that kind of, of, of difference. I mean we're not seeing these huge product innovations that we had once seen. Yes, we do have, you know, uh, uh, new fancy cell phones that have better cameras and touch screens and voice commands, but they're not out there really making the advancements that we need. And so I don't see how this is justified. Yes, they employ people, but lots of places employ people. This, this is creating such an unequal society and, 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 We've had ideas and policies and concepts put in place since the New Deal. Have those made any difference on, on what's happened with the pay gap here? Well, it's true the corporations employ people, but corporations also employed people back in 1965 when the ratio was $1 for an employee to $20 for the CEO. Uh, by 2012, it had risen up to uh, 354 for every dollar that the employee makes. Uh, I understand the current uh, today's figure is that it's now one dollar for the employee, 380 dollars for the CEO. Let's look at what that really means. If a worker earns 15 dollars per hour, it means that the CEO is getting 5,700 dollars per hour. A, a worker who earns 30,000 dollars a year the CEO is getting $11,400,000 a year. And the Americans uh, in this same survey we were talking about thought the gap was 30 to one. Uh, they thought the fair gap would be seven to one, but the actual gap is 54 times what the Americans' concept of fairness is. So it's just, an, uh, another thing was this, this inequality survey that was done worldwide the misconception doesn't vary by age, gender, income, political leanings, or education. Uh, the, the extent of misconception regarding the, the inequality of income, it's pervasive across all demographic lines. And, you know, that, that is a great point. It's not that people are just misinformed. It's that this is an issue, as we had discussed earlier, this is an issue that is not being brought up. You're not seeing it discussed on any of the cable news outlets, you know, very few independent outlets, alternate, obviously, with this piece by Les Leopold that we're discussing, you know, they did a good job of that. But these these issues and these ideas have to be brought to the public. You know, uh, these these writers deserve more attention. Their pieces like this deserve, you know, a, a place in, in conversation. I mean, the fact that so many Americans across party lines, across gender lines, across income lines don't know about this is, is very telling. And I, I, I think that's why it's so important that we are here talking about this today. I mean, I, I, I cannot stress that enough. And, you know, just, just moving on a bit, what does this do to our democracy when we end up with a, a CEO that makes $11 million and an employee 
that makes thirty thousand uh, dollars a year. What happens when when we get that? Well, the harsh fact is. Uh, the USA is the home of the American dream, obviously, uh, but we are uh, the epitome of democracy. We're perceived as the fairest, the most just, the most upwardly mobile country in the world. Yet, how can you be those things if you are also the most equal, uh, in, uh, the most unequal in the world in disparity of income? Uh, the conclusion of the study is that here, here's what happens. We tune out the data. We simply do not recognize reality. The reason is because it's counterintuitive to our national in, uh, identity and to our history. You know, post, post World War II, we had the highest standard of living in the world. Our annual wages increased every year during the Cold War years. We held our jobs out as the exemplar for the world. Income boosted every year. The middle class was the envy of the world. We wanted it to be that way because we were opposing communism. We had 50 years of prosperity for the average American worker. At the same time, the wealthy were paying uh, tax rates as high as 90%. Their share, they were living very well, but their share of the wealth was declining. But now, with, since both parties are refusing to address the rising inequality with meaningful remedies, our democracy as we know it, the American dream as we know it, is in severe jeopardy. It is, and, and worker productivity in that 50-year span has increased to its highest levels ever. Uh, worker retention has increased. Workers are putting out more. Wages have been stagnant for almost 12 years now. You know, and, and and I think that's that's kind of what corporate America's figured out. They said, look, we could just squeeze them. We can squeeze them as much as possible until they almost break. And at that point, that's what we can steal from them when it comes to the pay gap. And Howard, thank you so much for telling us the story today. It's a great one. I know we'll be talking about it again in the future. Um, it, it's something every American needs to be aware of, and they also need to be talking about this. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Farron. President Obama has made it clear that he supports disastrous trade deals like the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but luckily we've had enough Democratic representatives in Washington to keep the deal off the table. But this year's midterms elections have changed the makeup of Congress, and I have David Hirsch with me to tell us if the TPP is headed to the fast track for approval. So, David, we, we're now looking at a situation where President Obama, who supports the Trans-Pacific Partnership, he's going to get this new Republican majority in the Senate. He's going to get a stronger Republican majority in the House. What is this going to mean for, you know, these trade deals like the TPP coming up? Well, you know, the TPP causes me real concern because if he gets the fast-track authority, if, if Obama gets the fast-track authority out of the House, then this really ends up being a trade negotiation that can be done in secret, one that is not open to public scrutiny, it's not public to, for debate or for analysis, but becomes binding on an up or down vote, which with the new majority uh, and control in Congress uh, provides a, a real avenue for pushing this through despite what the ramifications may really be. And, and, you know, this we, we've already seen things like this with the uh, Keystone XL pipeline. I mean, and this is before they've even taken over the House. They brought that issue to the floor for an up or down vote. So, you know, I, I, I think issues like the Trans-Pacific Partnership are, are clearly going to be on the agenda for everyone because, as, as we've discussed on the show in the past, it is a huge giveaway for corporate America, these very same corporations that help put these Republicans uh, and, and Obama into office. It's, it's an amazing giveaway for corporate America. It is an amazing opportunity for uh, corporate profits to soar, to outsource American jobs, to create virtually perpetual intellectual property rights, which means that, for example, Big Pharma. Big Pharma is going to have the ability, if TPP goes through, to have almost an indefinite, non-terminable right to control patents on drugs that from which they make millions of dollars, which means that it's more expensive, not only in the United States, but across the ocean. It's more expensive to obtain, and impossible to obtain generic drugs, for example, 
Uh, it's nothing more than, than corporate profits. And then we're going to see things like outsourcing of jobs because as these corporations are given the ability to sue governments to enforce their right to profit, we're going to end up with American jobs that are, are taken away because the, the barriers to outsourcing those jobs to other countries are removed and the job practices that, frankly, we wouldn't tolerate in America become the new minimum standard for those jobs. And it's very disappointing considering the fact that in this, in this election, in addition to the you know, Republican tidal wave, so to speak, we also had a lot of areas all over the country that voted for an increase in minimum wage. And so now that we have really, really good forward momentum on wage increases, you know, we, we've even got momentum within the federal government for, for federal employees and contractors. TPP, not only could it allow them to outsource, but corporations could legally come in and say, no, 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 your minimum wage laws do not apply to me because it hurts my ability to do business in America. I mean, that's that's what this is. This gives a corporation, any corporation, the ability to come into America and say, the policies of my company supersede the policies of your government. So TPP has an interesting concept in it, uh, which is the ISDS, which is where the investor can sue the state. And so, it, for example, we've seen this in Central America, where in agreements that have these kind of provisions in them. So a local authority, a judicial body, a legislature determines that we shouldn't uh, strip mine a particular area that's sensitive environmentally. Well, under an ISDS uh, opportunity, the corporation is able to come in, sue the government, sue the authority, have a determination as to whether or not this is an unfair practice that harms the corporation's profits, have the decision of the country set aside, and they can recover billions of dollars in, quote, lost profits, which are going to mean that American workers, health care, our food networks, our environmental concerns, these are all going to be cast aside by private courts that are going to decide whether or not corporate profits reign supreme. And given TPP, they will. They and will. We've, we, we've already seen this with NAFTA. Uh, a Absolutely. great example of what you just pointed out was that Exxon went to Canada wanted to do some offshore drilling in an area that was protected. Canada said no. Uh, uh, Exxon came back under the protection of NAFTA, legally challenged it, and won. And this was an area that had not been drilled, one of the few areas of Canada where they said, okay, you know what? Oil industry, we're not going to let you come in and take over this part. But Exxon said, no, no, no. NAFTA says I can. NAFTA says I'm right. You have to allow me. And they did. And, and, and so when we look at it uh, in those ways... Every bit of our offshore area, our protected lands, this is going to be opening, uh, opened up for drilling, for fracking, for pipelines. And, and, and you brought in the, the idea of the, the pharmaceutical industry, and they have been very instrumental in the, the lobbying for the Trans-Pacific Partnership because for them, this is another huge way to get into markets that they haven't been allowed into because if you think about it, the United States government is one of the only governments that does not negotiate drug prices with Big Pharma. All other countries, they pay about a 10% markup. We get TPP, suddenly that 10% markup that they had negotiated with the government is out the door. Out the door. Another area that really concerns me and frightens me, quite frankly, is our food safety and our food constituent qualities because under TPP, it's going to be the lowest common denominator for food safety, for the application of pesticides, for harvesting practices, for uh, GMO issues. And so the result of that's going to be that countries like the United States, and I'm not a big fan of the FDA, but, but at least we've got something here that regulates food purity and food, food quality. And we have tools that can be used to try to prevent GMO, uh, try to prevent uh, unwanted pesticide contamination in our food chain, but under the TPP, we're going to have the minimum standards of other countries. Those then become the measuring standards, and big corporations are going to be able to sue to enforce only those minimum standards, meaning the Americans in our country who are now in the driver's seat are going to be stuck receiving imports of inferior food that is contaminated. We won't be able to, for example, on beef, 
We currently have regulations on which beef we will allow into our country. Well, if the other country under TPP certifies that it's safe, we just have to accept that. And that puts American consumers at risk. And all of this, all of this is being done in secret. It's being leaked out in little bits and pieces. There's a reason it's being done in secret. It's because it's dangerous, it's inimical to the Americans, to our country, it's inimical to our health and well-being. Absolutely, and, and that is a great point. We only know what we know about TPP because it has been leaked. They didn't want us to know anything about this, and I, I, I can almost promise you that had those leaks not occurred, if none of this had been put out in the open, and there's still, I, I mean, I, I don't even think we know half of what's in there. But I guarantee you this thing would have already been put in place. And, and real quick, in about the minute we have left, w- uh, you know, we, we started off talking about the fast track. We've got the, the new Republican majorities that are bec- uh, going to be sworn in in, in January. Uh, a year from now, what do you think will be the status of TPP? Well, I'm frightened, frankly, because I think that with the amount of money that's at stake here, with the amount of money that's being spent, with the re-election campaigns that are already cranking up, with the, the promises that have to be delivered by those who were purchased into office, I think we're likely to see TPP move to the forefront. We know that Obama is already traveling extensively in Asia, promoting this as a package signature part of his administration. And I, I think that he's, we're likely to see it move through. It'll be interesting to see whether or not he gets the fast track, uh, but I don't think there's going to be time for a public debate. It's, it's very sad that one of the only issues that we're actually seeing uh, bipartisanship, we're seeing the two sides come together, is the one issue that the American public simply can't afford to see passed. Uh, David Hirsch, appreciate everything you do. Appreciate you telling us this story. We will stick with it, and we will do everything we can to fight this. Thank you very much. You bet. Thanks for your help. Earlier this week, Mike Papantonio had the opportunity to speak with Attorney Peter Muget on why the Securities and Exchange Commission has failed to enact any of the safeguards that they were supposed to put in place to help protect American consumers. Let's take a listen to what they had to say. The Securities and Exchange Commission has a list of reforms and regulations that they need to put into place to help stop Wall Street criminal behavior. Budget cuts, staff cuts, and just plain laziness have caused the agency to fall dangerously behind on their reform measures. And I have Peter Mouget with me to tell you what's happened. Peter, I remember everybody was so jubilant, especially everybody paying attention to Wall Street and how it burned down our economy. They were so jubilant. When Dodd-Frank passed, you know, we were saying, oh, my gosh, there's a chance that you can hold these criminals responsible. And then along comes uh, this Mary Jo woman. What an awful, awful selection to run the SEC. Uh, But tell us what's happening. Tell us how bad things really are about how things really are not moving at all to to move forward with Dodd-Frank. Well, the scary part, Pap, is when you compare what the SEC's accomplished with what some of the SEC uh, other regulators have done. The SEC is dramatically behind the other regulators. CFTC is bringing in all their studies and rulemaking proposals in for a landing. I mean, they're almost done. The SEC, on the other hand, is dramatically behind, materially behind. So as you said, everyone in 2010 thought this is going to be a catalyst for meaningful change, and it hasn't happened, in a large part because once again, we're behind, we're slower, the, the problems are still persist, and the, the rules haven't come forward like they're supposed to. And there's a couple really good examples of, uh, of why they haven't. The first one I like, Pap, is the executive compensation. We, and you and I have talked about this before. The, the SEC has got to align SEC compensation with the fundamental progress of a company. You've got to say, CEO, you make X amount of dollars if the company makes uh, uh, per earnings per share over long periods of time. The metrics have got to align. Compensation with performance. Just like your compensation, just like mine, just like the rest of the world's. Performance with compensation. And the SEC, four years later, and, and you and I have talked about this before, I think this is the fundamental problem 
with Wall Street, with corporate big company America, is that the uh, folks that are leading these companies, their compensation isn't aligned with performance. Four years later, hasn't been done, and it's oh, not okay, a complicated well, let me one. Ask, let me ask you something. This, this horrible, I mean, I just don't, I can't overstate how horrible this SEC, SEC chair, Mary Jo White, really is. First of all, she's nothing more than a corporate hack. Everybody knew that when she came in, she was completely tied to the banking industry. They tell her what to do. They tell her how to jump. And while she's in the air, she says, can I jump higher? She is nothing more than a corporate stooge. But, she, but, but, but Bush, I mean, excuse me, Obama appoints her knowing that and knowing how serious the problem is. And this very issue, this, this corporate comp, this uh, CEO compensation, that, how simple is that? There's nothing complex about that, is there? But she argues, she argues, oh, my God, it's just too complex to do that. Isn't that her argument? And, and absolutely. And it's all these different constituencies. We have to, you know, have the banks. We have to have all these different regulators. Or we're having these uber governmental regulator type meetings. But this one's not like that, Pap. And I think it's why a great example, and it's the, it, it really exposes the problem with the regulators with this turnover from regulator to law firm, regulator to corporate America, this revolving door, nobody wants to upset the apple cart too much. And that's why I think this executive compensation is such a great example of the core problem uh, with why these rules aren't getting done. My Lord, we don't want to upset corporate America when we when we pass these uh, these metrics and get some reforms in. And the excuse always is how complicated these are. You've got to be kidding me. You can't. Well, okay, well, what you just described, I mean, there, 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 there are dozens of issues that Mary Jo White has has done uh, has just made disappear as far as is is going forward with Dodd Frank. She has deep sixed most of the very important issues, it, and she always comes up and says, "Oh, gee, we can't do it. It's too complicated. We're trying. We'll have something for you in 2020." This is the best example of what a lie that is. But talk about other things that the, this SEC uh, this SEC is bent determined to protect their crony thugs on Wall Street and to hell with the average person, to hell with the small bankers out there. We don't really care. Give us more examples. What have you seen? I'll tell you, you what, do another, this day to day. Another great example is the uh, fiduciary duty. Right now you have two different systems operating on Wall Street that, that Main Street America, no one knows the difference. If you go in and see your financial advisor, many financial advisors have fiduciary duties if in fact they're registered investment advisors. They call them R so if you're a registered investment advisor, you have to put uh, your client's interest first. On the other hand, you have uh, what they call registered reps or what everybody calls a stockbroker. You go see your stockbroker in many states, most states, those fiduciary duties are either non-existent or they're severely limited. And one of these rules that uh, the SEC is supposed to be looking at, again, something not real complicated is, should in fact we have fiduciary standards that apply across the board, registered investment advisors or stockbrokers, have them all the same, the same standards that apply. And of course, the problem is, if in fact you have fiduciary standards that apply to the stockbrokers, is that they have to put their interests first, the client's interests first, and they have to disclose potential conflicts of interest. And, and we know they don't. We know they. We know for the most part they're not going to get. The, the Goldman Sachs story is the best example oh, of what you're talking about, isn't it? The Goldman Sachs know. Well, you tell the story. They know the product's failing, and they go forward. Selling Abacus. Anyway. Uh, Goldman Sachs structured a deal, Abacus, for one of its clients, and it structured. It was structured finance. It involved mortgages. And of course, the mortgages you have in the, the structured product uh, dictate the, uh, the probable performance or failure of that product. Goldman Sachs put together a product intending it to fail. And they put it together, but didn't disclose it to the client that came and asked for the product to be put together. And Goldman Sachs profited if it failed. So it's the opposite side of the transaction. And that's one of the SEC rules that still haven't been passed. It's, it's a hedging rule. Do you have to disclose to your clients your hedges or what you're shorting so, in fact, they know? Well, and, I Peter, it's, it's this bad. It, it, you, you, mom and pop, goes to a stockbroker. The day before the burn down, before everything right. collapses, Goldman Sachs is telling mom and pop, gee, this is a great investment, knowing Goldman Sachs, knowing they built it to fail because they had insurance that was going to pay them when it failed. 
Now, your point is the SEC has this in front of them. Should that be should that be legal? And you're saying the SEC can't even move on something as basic as that. Did Absolutely. I get that right? I, yeah, and that's a great way to put it. I love the insurance word as opposed to hedging. That's exactly a, that's a perfect description. So at the end of the day, what, what we're asking for is fiduciary standards should apply. It doesn't matter if you're a registered representative. It doesn't matter if you're a stockbroker. The investing public should know that fiduciary standards, that the investor, mom and pop, their interests have to be put first. Now, what is so complicated about that? When you go back to Dodd-Frank, why haven't those, those studies that the SEC has been looking at for four years? Well, I'll tell you why. Because corporate America, Wall Street, doesn't want it implemented. They don't want to have to put mom and pop's interest first. The, the, of course, the defense is, oh, it's going to be so expensive, and oh, it's going to slow down business, and oh, this is just so problematic. Well, the problem is they don't want to put their own clients, mom and pop, that quite frankly shoulder most of the stock market through mutual funds, and the retirement accounts, their interests are put behind the bottom line of Wall Street. And that's a perfect, two perfect examples, executive compensation and the fiduciary duties that are not complicated. We're not talking about swap transactions, derivatives. We're talking about principled rulemaking, uh, fiduciary and, duty and executive compensation that are, uh, like you said, have been deep six. And, and, and Obama knew when he, when he appointed Mary Jo White, that she 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 is all about trying to make sure that her thuggish crony friends on Wall Street make more money and that's why Dodd Frank is dead or dying and I don't expect anything to happen. Look, you know what, Peter? I'm just glad you're out there suing these guys because this is the only this is the only way we would learn about these stories. And I, I appreciate you joining me. Let's continue this discussion uh, about as Dodd Frank supposedly dies, let's talk about the death of Dodd Frank step by step so America can see that the next burn down is just right around the corner. Thank you for Sounds joining good. me. Thank you. That's it for this week's Ring of Fire, but you can keep up with us throughout the week online at ringoffireradio.com, on Twitter at Ring of Fire Radio, and on Facebook. For Mike Papantonio, I'm Farron Cousins, and we'll see you next week right here on Ring of Fire.